Good morning. Good afternoon. Hi, evening, Nubians. Love you. Uja Seneb to everyone. Yes. Yes. Uncle Justin, of life and health, and I mean, life, power, and health, huh? Prosperity, prosperity, right? Not power, prosperity. Power is uh, what is power? Was the oh. was scepter. It's actually the word the Greeks called the city Luxor, but it's waset, the place of power. So you could say was, but yeah, Seneb, Uncle Uja, Seneb, life, prosperity, and health. Yes. I was actually asking asking a, a 2022 question about power. Uh, oh. But let me before we get to that. Um, uh, Easter's tomorrow, so um, <laughs> shout out to all, yep. Um, and it's interesting. You were, I was talking a little bit yesterday on Foolishness Friday on my show about the evolution. You know, being a little girl, getting her ears burnt, top of her ears <laughs> getting crispy, getting ready to go to church. You know, crispy. little Easter shoes. You got to have a whole Easter outfit, our little yellow dresses with the little frizzle, frizzle, frizzle frazzle stuff, and just getting ready for that whole. You know, the, being in the kitchen with my mom, doing the Easter egg coloring, and all of the little baskets with that little green stuff in it, and the peeps and the chocolate bunnies, and you mm. know, it's it's such a tradition in many homes that I don't want to defile it. You know, in this space. Oh but, no, of course not. Yeah, um, you but can't you really know. defile defile it. Mm. Mm. You could defile it. Well, you could attempt to defile it, but that's the funny thing about hardcore folk. They, you know, we will at times do that and then sneak and do something else. So rail, rail, rail against Easter, and then still take the kids to the Easter egg hunt, or go buy the or eat the chocolate bunny that happened to be laying around the house. I thought you was against. Oh, I get it. I get it. But you live in the real world. <laughs> so so we really, can't really, you know. <laughs> really quickly, I know you've been through all of the solstices. We've we've done that in uh in class. Yeah, we talked about the win winter and in in uh winter and we're in the spring solstice, yeah. But when did you stop? Because I know you were raised in, in a you know in a oh, no question. faithful family, you know, no like grass, the grass and dyeing the eggs and the kits and the, yeah, this time the, on a Saturday morning like this, the day before Easter, yeah, we we getting ready for the uh to go to Canaan New Baptist Church so they can hide the Easter eggs, no question. We hunt them on the lawn. When did you stop? When did you say this is yeah? Oh, that's interesting. Um Probably, well, before I knew the origins. So, I mean, you know, like any other person, you get to late adolescence, early teens, maybe a little older. So about college, maybe high school, you know, you stop doing that. But, you know, it's like a lot of ritual. In fact, um, hmm, I look for, you know, anytime, anytime I get in that liminal space with Christianity, I just, you know, my my out in terms of arguing, because as Theophilo Benga says, there are three bases of knowledge. There's knowledge by opinion, which you can't prove unless you establish some common frame of reference. You know, is Kobe better than Jordan? Well, my opinion, okay, well, what are we going to do? We're going to go to numbers. We're going to go to longevity. Yeah, I mean, you talk about one came for the other. There's, there's that. You can't really win those debates. See, people have their opinions. Then there's knowledge by fact. What a Bingham might say is knowledge by reason. If we got a we got a straight standard we can all agree on, we can just plug this stuff in and then we get way getting it falls where it may. So people say, well, Jackie Robinson was the first black person to integrate major league baseball. Okay, number one, what is our framework? If our framework, in fact, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but uh, and I'll tell you the Easter, but this is a, a journal called the National Pastime. They did this. This is a special edition they did for the 1992 Olympics. This is 30 years ago. There's the man, the hammer, Henry Aaron, uh, on the cover with the uh, brother who played for the Murray Giants, who was the um, uh, the all time. Oh, right. Oh, right. Um, but there's an article in here by Peter um, Jarkman called Cuban Blacks in the Majors before Jackie Robinson. So this is knowledge by fact. So he says. He says he begins the article by saying perhaps the greatest difference between Jackie Robinson, acknowledged pioneer of baseball's integration, and Hiram Bithorn, forgotten journeyman pitcher for the lowly wartime Chicago Cubs, was in the, quote, color, end quote, of their linguistic inflections, the distinctive rhythms of their speech patterns. In other words, the second dude spoke Spanish. 
<laughs> and so if you wanted to play in white major league baseball before Jack Roosevelt Robinson, you called yourself a Cuban or the people who were trying to exploit that talent called you a Cuban. And so the second category, uh, knowledge wait, by wait, fact. Wait. So if you were a black person that spoke Spanish, major league baseball did not consider you black. Well, it depended. And it also depends on color of your skin. So the kind of cafe au lait Cubans who were very good, Venezuela, they say you're from Mexico. They had a way. And sometimes they call you Native American. So always be suspect when you look at the baseball records for anybody named Chief. That was the nickname. Go and look at them. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, oh, so now this is now it's about fact. Now, people will be like, oh, Jackie Robinson, everybody calm down. What is your standard? English speaking from the United States, people of African descent. And even then, it's so funny, Karen, because uh, the black press. This is why we got, in fact, I showed my students this on Thursday morning. We were in the introduction to African States class and I pulled up, I always like on the, the day or whatever day a class is near today, I'll play them Count Basie. Did you see Jackie Robinson hit that ball? We talk about the, what the Yoruba would call the Oriki. In other words, what is the, the, the way that black people in our African States framework, cultural meaning making, mark that moment in time and space. Basie and them made a song. They made the Joe Louis Blues. They made the see Jack Robinson hit that ball. But then I showed them headlines from the Chicago Defender and the New York Amsterdam News. When Robinson made his debut, the Defender runs an article. Robinson becomes first Negro in prose since Fleet Moses. The black print. Now, the thing is, whoever the fact checker was or the headline writer, rather, they inverted the name. In the 1880s, Moses Fleetwood Walker was the catcher for the Toledo Blue Stockings. He was the first black baseball player. He was born in the United States. He was also an immigrationist with an E. He was like, we should just leave this country and go to Africa. I mean, he had all kind of political positions. <laughs> this is like 1884, 1885. Cap Anson, that racist in the Hall of Fame, white nationalist racist, uh, he ref he played for Chicago White Stockings, now the Chicago White Sox. He refused to play with him. He said, and then he got it written in the contract. I don't play if any black people are on the field. Now, that eventually led a few years later to what they call the gentleman's agreement. In other words, we will ban blacks from professional baseball. So, and of course, that lasted until April the 15th, 1947, when Jack wrote, wait, Obinga said the second category is knowledge by fact. Now we have to agree. You're talking, even if you're talking about English speaking people of African descent born in the United States, Jack Robinson, not the first. Now, are you talking about the modern version of professional baseball that we call me? Okay, if you're going to say that, now the thing about it is, this ain't even no arguing among historians, among sports writers. The only places of argument come people who don't know. Obinga finally getting to Easter says the third category. Is knowledge by faith. You can never win an art. Don't ever argue faith because this is belief. <laughs> you understand? So you ask me, when did I? No, no. My out dealing with Christianity or Islam or Jude, any of the Abrahamic faith tradition or any article of faith is to go find somebody that people will accept as a person of that faith. And say, well, let's see what they say. And of course, my go out, my get out of jail free car for Christianity is always Howard Thurman. So Howard Thurman <laughs> writes about Easter. Now, here's how they get out. Of course, we know we told you, and we, of course, those of you who are not yet in narrative, understand we, you know, Professor Hunter and I, we did a long thing on Howard Thurman. So we got Howard Thurman. And usually what Christians will do, because everybody knows article by faith, uh, belief, uh, knowledge by faith, it ain't opinion. It ain't fact. It's faith. And you know, and I know that y'all don't believe that this, all of this is factual. Some of y'all will say it's metaphor. And the way that the Christians want to, who want to continue to hang on to Howard Thurman, they just call him a mystic. He said, oh, he's a, he's a mystic. Okay. I know. I know y'all. I know y'all want some room to breathe. We all, I mean, because some of that stuff in there, you're taking as the article of faith. That's fine. Nobody going to argue with you. I mean, in, in Islam, they may say, okay, the Sufis, the Sufi, the mystic Muslims. Okay. Everybody wants some space to operate. The Jews, you want to talk about the mystics. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, so when you hear mystic, 
That's somebody looking for some space to breathe in the faith because they got questions that can't be answered it, because what ends up happening, and Obinga used to, we used to laugh about this all the time. Obinga would say, you know, people get in problems when they start crossing those categories. Now they want to argue about, well, if Jesus was in the tomb, it was a rented tomb, right? but they didn't really see. Okay, so now here you are trying to establish a factual timeline with Jesus Christ instead of just accepting it as a metaphor. It ain't no metaphor. I believe it. Okay, that's faith. Fine. I'm not arguing with your faith. That's what you believe. That's fine. Okay, so what Howard Thurman does, and I won't read him. I'll just mention this. This is in a book called The Growing Edge, Sermons by Howard Thurman. This is an old book. In fact, there's been a, a new sect. They, they've begun to publish some of his, you know, there are one, two, three, four, five volumes in the Howard Thurman papers that have some of his sermons. Uh, there's a There are recordings of Howard Thurman's sermons that are available. Uh, you can download some of them from his papers. You know, uh, Boston University has a lot of his papers. And then there are, there are several volumes that have just been published. One is called, I'm looking over here to see if I can read from here, The Way of the Mystics. <laughs> That's a volume of his sermons that hadn't yet been published other places. Another one is called Moral Struggle and the Prophets. This is Thurman. These are these are a couple of Thurman biographers. I think it's Peter Eisenstadt, who may have been working with our brother uh, Fluker, um, but at any Walter Fluker. But at any rate, so this is a, this is a volume of sermons as well. But this this predates all of that stuff. The Cutting Edge, I think, came out. Let me see. It's 1956. But he's got a sermon in here on easter it's called the quest for immortality believe it or not we're coming to the pressed hair the burnt ear tips the eggs the new clothes the quest for immortality because what lies at the heart of at least christianity and islam what lies at the unresolved tension at the heart of judaism that says that yeah, Jesus Christ, we believe Jesus Christ lived, but he wasn't the one who returned. He's not the Messiah. The tension that lies at the heart of these, uh, what <laughs> Yosef Ben Yakin and Dr. Ben wrote a book on that called The African Origin of the Major Western Religions, because none of them are Western. They're all African exports, if you listen to Dr. Ben's very good friend and colleague, John Henry Clark. But the way they were remixed, what lie, the tension that lies at the at the heart of it is a tension that has preoccupied human beings probably since we've been on the planet, and that it get codified in the societies like the Egyptians, for example. The Egyptians are guilty of this, which is why <laughs> Denzel Washington told Desus, Desus and Mero, you know, you can't take, you don't never see uh, um, all your possessions. Uh, lined up behind a hearse and you can use them in the future. Why? The Egyptians tried that. They tried to bury all their stuff. In other words, what the tension that lies is, nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to die. As Dizzy Gillespie recorded in uh, Swing Low, Sweet Cadillac, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there, heaven. <laughs> everybody want to go to heaven. Everybody want to go to heaven. Everybody, nobody want to die. But then in that old song go, everybody uh, want to go to heaven, but nobody want to die. Why? Because you have that uncertainty. When I die, am I going to, what's going to happen to me? So you want faith. You try to take out an insurance policy. A lot of people join these religions for insurance policies. But what Howard Thurman. Ooh, I, I just had to. Mm. What? what? Oh. <laughs> hmm. If if we didn't know if, if there was no heaven. Then what all it is, is what you do here. Hmm. Would we make different choices? You know, the, the battle, the battlefield, we see it, you know, over this, you know, who has the right to God and who has the right to heaven and and people wear that as a shield, you know, because it absolves them here and now from being better. Right. That's right. I just. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, well, I would say, you know, we know that. Well, we know kind of what people think about that. I'm going to resist the urge to go around here and grab this book that uh, uh, Tracy Sherrod, your friend, who uh, you brought in. And those of you who are not yet in Nubia, we are starting on Monday night, the front matter of Barracoon, all the way up to part one. We're going to stop at part one. And then next week, the 25th, we're going to do from part one to part seven of Barracoon. But in a beautiful conversation 
Oh, y'all don't know. We just getting started. And the oh my God, it's so powerful. When you brought Tracy Sherrod in, in a minute, I hope you, you talk some more about that. Uh, she, of course, a uh, major figure, major person of African descent in the world of social structure uh, publishing, white face and publishing. Uh, she, with the Gregory family, chiefly, you know, Christian Gregory, Dick Gregory's son, who handles a lot of the business. They've been bringing Dick Gregory's books back into print. And one of the ones that they did, uh, the one that was published just as he made transition was an original book on black history. And I helped prep him for that book. We met, we would talk for hours. He's revving up his engines, getting this stuff together. And uh, they asked me to write the introduction to the book, preface, forward. So forward. So I was very happy to do that. But the um, reason I bring this up in the context of when you ask the question, Prof, you know, what if we, you know, if we didn't believe or what? Well, you know, Dick Gregory talks about and he's talked. He talks about he talked about this a lot. He talked to me about it all the time. And then he, he writes about this, of course, including in this last book that Tracy made sure got into print. In fact, it came out just as he was making transition. He talks about the conversations he would have with John Lennon around that very question. So imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. <laughs> in other words, in other words, if, if you imagine that there's nothing after this, then you have to make this that place. That's that's the that's the premise of John Lennon's song and the conversation he and Dick Gregory had about it. That Dick Gregory said led to the song. <laughs> imagine. <laughs> Just imagine. It's very simple. <laughs> I keep saying, you know, we need to build the place that we want to see. You know, everyone's waiting for somebody to come and rescue. Even, you know, Jesus coming in on a cloud. We're waiting for him to come back to do what exactly? Like, that's our responsibility. And and if you're really, really about that Christian life, or if you're really, really about that faithful life, then you know the responsibility is on you to manifest that on earth, right? To manifest all of those principles that you say if you ever read the Bible and not just let somebody give you some scriptures that may not even be in the Bible. That's your responsibility, right? They Y'all got these, what would Jesus do bracelets and ain't nobody doing anything that he would do. Nope. I'm just like, nope. What's the point? What's the point? Whole ass <laughs> war is being fought around these notions that people aren't even committed to really. So That's right. Well, I mean, if we, if we would just simply we don't have to ask what would Jesus do if you accept the Jesus Christ of the New Testament, whose authority is established through genealogy at the beginning, all those begats. If you accept that not only, well, you can accept it either as faith. You could even accept it as fact. If you do, then just read. It's pretty simple. I mean, here's a guy who shout out to shovel mouth, Greg Abbott. Who is sending people to uh, from Texas to D.C.? Shout out to the hillbillies in Tennessee state legislature, including the Republican state senator, who compared uh, the people who don't have a place to sleep at night and they've outlawed it now. You can't sleep in Tennessee public parks; they'll find you or lock you up or both. And he said, "Well, Hitler was homeless for a while, and he turned out to do great things." I'm like, "Boy, these I, I love these hillbillies. I love the white nationalists because you're gonna break it." And you dropped all pretense now. And now we see your naked ass face. And now we can decide which side are you on. It's really very simple. But shout out to all you who would treat the people who don't have a place to sleep at night. A permanent place. Who would treat them with contempt. And then go to your funky ass church. Yeah, I said it. You mad? Don't get mad, Twan. Don't get mad. Go read your book. Did Jesus own a house? In fact, I used to, I used to, when I was, sometimes I would speak at churches and I'd be like, man, this is a nice facility. Now, if Jesus Christ showed up here and said, can I spend the night? Would y'all let him? Like, and if he said, well, hold on now, you got my name on the door. <laughs> this miles, right? You keep saying this miles, church of Christ. Can I come in here? And or he ain't have a place to sleep. The man is, this is the season of Easter, right? Palm Sunday Easter. What do you say? He was buried in a, in a rented tomb, right? I'm not going to get into that. This is your faith, right? But if it's your faith, read the book. Here's a guy who the government decided was an enemy of the state. It's very simple. It's not a matter of opinion. It's at least in terms of the book. If, if, we're, if we're accepting the book as the framework, the Bible, 
the New Testament, any of the testaments, then this is a guy who the state attacked, not because he's sabotaging lines like Nelson Mandela was doing and Unconto is his way and blowing up power plants and said, no, he wasn't engaged in guerrilla warfare. He just ran telling people, you know, everybody feed the homeless, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, sermon on the mount. Y'all know, y'all, y'all read that stuff, right? And so the state is like, this guy got to go. This is a problem. Oh, he's a communist <laughs> or whatever. Anyway, they didn't have communism then. But then again, maybe they did. I don't know. Anyway, the point is this. He got to go. So what do you do? Well, some things you allow to play out naturally. Because, you know, even within his own community, you got them Negroes who you've already recruited to believe that, you know, we just have to turn within and, and improve ourselves. And then they've gotten a little status in the community. You know, petty bourgeois Negroes. They already don't like him. Because he's he's drawing away these people who they prey on in order to maintain their status. I can hear E. Franklin Frazier in the ancestral realm chuckling at this metaphor from uh, his 1957 book, Black Bourgeoisie. These are the Negroes who, you know, you know, the ones Carter Woodson was talking about. Y'all Christians, well, y'all praying on black men. So you got them Pharisees and Sadducees, you know, all them people y'all was reading about in that book. So they it's a, you let that kind of play out. These are the Negroes who shrank away from Martin Luther King. Right when he came out against the war in Vietnam, he started talking about militarism and materialism being problems that have to be and racism. These are the people who we spent a month reading. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community where Martin Luther King, nobody. Nobody escapes his critical analysis, beginning with himself, the white liberals, but not just the white liberals, the black bourgeoisie. He's a member of that class. And these are the people who. When you read uh, the recent book on Martin Luther King, where it begins with, which I've talked about a couple of times, uh, Andrew Douglas, and I forget the uh, other dude's name, the co-author right now. I'd have to go and look for it over there. Um, where King is arguing with his staff and Andy Young gets ready to say something. He said, I don't want to hear from you today, Andy. You're a capitalist. You know what I'm saying? So these are, so, so some of the stuff you let kind of percolate up. You're against Jesus. You just let the internal class divisions. And then you say, okay, this ain't moving fast enough. So that's when you go get, you know, you the feds, Rome. So you go buy some informants. Judas, my man, how much? Jared Loggins. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, Jared, Jared A. Loggins. Yes. Loggins and, and Douglas. Yes. So when you get Judas on the payroll, he loved, more, he loved money more than this bull. So that's cool. Judas is good, but then, you know, Judas gets the money for betraying him, whomsoever I shall kiss that same as he Jesus, hold him fast. So he does that, and, uh, you know, he can't live with himself because he realized the money is not enough. I know what I did. And then you take him, you put him on a sham trial, you know, the criminal justice system, and uh, then you got the people deadened by cancel culture and social media or whatever that was of the day, and they pick Barabbas over Jesus to let go, and Pontius Pilate is like, yeah, man, I'm just, you know, I'm just a bureaucrat. You know, this is you people crazy. And you know, I'm, I'm I'm washing my hands at this book. All right, you know, that's the judiciary. Don't do that to us, Kataji. I mean, well, then again, who is we? But the whole point is that and Jesus gets killed. He's executed by the state. Voila. We've seen that show a million times. So what would Jesus do? You know damn well what would Jesus do? That's why you don't do it. As Obrey Hendricks, my friend Obrey Hendricks always says, people say they're Christians, but it's not Christianity, it's churchianity. You, you took the piety, you took the words, you took the mother may I approach to religion instead of the actual lived tradition of Christ. And you, you know, you kind of feel good about yourself because really why you got into it in the first place is you don't want to die, which brings me back to Howard Thurman. <laughs> You say you can do whatever the hell you want. Your death breath. You can just get that last gasp. At like, oh, oh forgive me. <laughs> You're in. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. And that's why Howard Thurman, in another Easter Thurm sermon he gives, he calls it the glad surprise. This is that. We go into the burnt ear tips and the Easter eggs and everything else, right? Easter is the season, the equinox, the return of life, the eternal return of life. Howard Thurman says there is ever something compelling and exhilarating about the glad surprise. The emphasis is upon glad. There are surprises that are shocking, startling, frightening, and bewildering. Be bewildering. But the glad surprise is something different from all of these. 
It carries with it the element of elation, of life, of something over and beyond the surprise itself. The experience itself comes at many levels. The simple joy that comes when one discovers that the balance in the bank is larger than the personal record indicated. And there is no error in accounting. The, realize, the realization that one does not have his door key. The hour is late and everyone is asleep. But someone very thoughtfully left the latch off just in case. I stand at the door and knock. <laughs> anyway, let me not do that. because Jesus was at the door too. He goes on. He says, finally, he says, there's a deeper meaning in the concept of the glad surprise. This meaning has to do with the very ground and foundation of hope about the nature of life itself. You see where we're going? The manifestation in this quality of, in the world about us can best be witnessed in the coming of spring. It is ever a new thing, a glad surprise. Oh, the temperatures. Oh, I don't need my coat. Oh, look, I hear the birds. Oh, oh, the air. It's a glad surprise. Spring. Every year, when's it coming? When's it coming? I'll be glad when spring is here. Oh, man, I'll be glad when spring is here. Sermon go, uh, Thurman goes on and says, it is ever a new thing, a glad surprise, the stirring of life at the end of winter. One day there seemed to be no signs of life, and then almost overnight, swelling buds, delicate blooms, blades of grass, bugs, insects, an entire world of newness everywhere. It is the glad surprise at the end of winter. Take courage, therefore. Now, I'll pause there. That's enough. Uh, this is, of course, this is the one that his daughter uh, edited called uh, For the Inward Journey, the writings of Howard Thurman. We talked about this again. We talked extensively about Howard Thurman, the man. Here's the thing. Once the Romans have killed Jesus, they, they got a problem now. Yeah, hey, you done martyred him. And, and them cats over there said, not only is he coming back, he done come back. And he ascended and he said he gonna be back. Oh, okay. So they just in some old crazy shit. All right, no problem. Got, no, 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 no. You don't understand. You don't understand. Now they ain't scared of you. Oh. Okay, so how many of them is this? A couple of cults. Hell no. Uh, this cop over here said he, he had a man in. He saw 300 of them over here by the river. With, I mean, and then it was another thousand of them. Oh, shit, it's growing? Huh. It took them a couple of centuries to figure out they couldn't kill it. So, of course, if you can't kill it, you join it. The Romans is like, shit, we can't stomp it out. Let's join it. Hmm. But here's the problem. You got all these other people through faith who believe what you were doing before this cat showed up. And this cat, what he was talking about, and what these other people believe who were doing this stuff before he showed up, whether they be the Jews, or whether they be what now would be called the pagans, or the heathens, realizing that that word, ethnic, comes from, well, the, the Greek, and then the Latin use is for, for the Romans would use it uh, for uh, ethnic, or ethne, ethne would be the Greek. They would say people who are heathens aren't part of us. The the Greeks would say they're not Greek. It's, it's the root is the root of the word heathen is ethnic. It's same ethne. It's the same root for ethnic, other, other than. So the Romans are like, well, you got all these other thans who will be called pagans now. But guess what connects them all? Hope. I hope I get to live forever. I hope I could become, I could have eternal life. Guess what? You can't get the glad surprise unless you die. And if you die and you don't live forever, ooh, I guess you ain't gonna know about it. People say, man, I'm, you know, I woke up this morning, so I'm great. And then I always say, yeah. And the day you don't wake up, you great too. Why? Because either it's something on the other side or you ain't gonna know about it. So <laughs> it's all right. In other words, I ain't, you know, I don't steal nobody joy, but let's be clear. Take a deep breath, tick knock high, release the breath, center, and guess what? As my man Paul Fitzgerald, now ancestor with my mom and everybody else, longtime deacon at Canaan New Baptist Church, it could be 50 degrees below zero with sleet and hailstorms outside, hailstones, the biggest size of golf balls. You come into church. Good morning, Brother Fitzgerald. Good morning. This beautiful morning. How you doing? I'm doing fine this beautiful morning. In other words, Paul Fitzgerald. That was my tick knock, huh? <laughs> Brother Fitzgerald, it don't matter what the weather is. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. As my daddy would say, it's lovely. Today is lovely. Why? There's an, there's an option. You breathing, ain't you? It's a lovely day. 
you know. So, but I'm raising all this as the context to say that in by the time you get to Christ, to Christ a couple thousand years ago, you have well-formed global traditions that are anchored by nature. And in the equinox moment, hemispherically, if you in the upper half of the ball we call the earth, then this is the spring equinox. The days are getting longer. You, the sun is out longer, or at least it appears that way because the earth is rotating around the sun. There's a shift now, and you see, it's like, wow, this is, I feel better. My my body is active. Oh, this is wonderful. So you're, you're, you, you are, you are hardwired. This is not about fact to respond. So you've got all these people now following this faith tradition that borrows from Judaism that predated it, Christ being Jewish, right? At least is what they say. I'm not going to get into all that. But now, though, however, there's the piece that was missing from that other one, which is, oh, no, I'm, I'm the guy. I'm back. And when I come back, the promise of eternal life is with me. Oh, this is the hope. This is the glad surprise. You got the glad surprise? Hey, man, I'm with him. So the Romans, you can't defeat it. You thought, man, it's a little regional thing. We got a problem out here with this Martin Luther King character, this Malcolm X character, this, you know, Sada Shakur, whatever y'all want. We, we didn't eliminate the threat. Wait, oh, y'all believe he came back? Oh, and that's a oh, pause. I'm not going to get into that because that story of the resurrection, you talk about metaphor. I'm saying even Mm -mm. stop stop <laughs> you know because i'm just i'm gonna stop myself i'm just i'm just saying the lady said she saw him and he didn't look like himself but she knew it was him and then he said okay all right good but none of y'all saw it no y'all listen to her right she said she saw him and he didn't look like himself right but she knew it was him right okay this is all faith nobody blood pressure raised but don't turn around them people who talk about a saw in a set and tell them Y'all crazy. It's all metaphor. Or not. Now it's by faith. Just saying. Not going to read it. As John Henry Clark used to say, he said, you know what? Because he grew up in the church too. Alabama, Sunday school, same school teacher as a kid. John Henry Clark said, when you start trying to read the Bible as a history book, that's when you're going to lose your mind. Just take it as an article of faith. <laughs> all right. So yesterday it was the 75th anniversary of Jackie Robinson. I saw you at an event because uh, yes. somebody had pictures of you. People had pictures of you at, I was so glad to see you. Yeah. At, at the uh, museum there in D.C. And also uh, this past week, um, Elon Musk tried to. I don't know what he was trying to do. So uh, let me just be 100 percent. I said on my radio show that I feel like, you know, the Wizard of Oz, like Elon Musk came and lifted the veil to let everybody know that this whole system is, you know, pulled by strings and we're yeah. all attached to these strings making these movements buying being outraged liking this not liking that based on somebody else's um master play and he showed it like he just like here's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna offer 40 billion i don't even know if i have any intention of purchasing it stock crash maybe he did it to crash the stock to buy more then Vanguard was like, wait a minute, let's come. And he's about to show all of us up. He's about to expose us all. Let me go and buy. So Vanguard now became the largest shareholder in one day. Oh. Interesting. And it's the number one story on Financial Times. I know you went to get the paper. Yeah, yeah. Here it is. I mean, it actually, the Russians are telling Americans, don't put no nuclear. Or, well, don't, you know, they just talk. It's crazy. Uh, shout out to the British. Thank you, Oz, for letting everybody else know as well. Uh, the British want to send everybody to Rwanda. Uh, that ain't the first time Rwanda has done that. You know, they want to send everybody who? In other words, immigrants, people trying to leave. The whole thing is when you leave northern France, you can uh, a lot of times people trying to get to the EU. Sometimes they'll come into England and that number has exploded. And, you know, EU uh, now with the Brexit, the, the British, you know, the British now have a. a uh, Boris Johnson and them, and even people that got, got speculations why he did it, but they're saying that if you come into Great Britain illegally, one of the things we might do is send you to Rwanda. <laughs> Wait, it? has is Rwanda in on it? Are they not, not only is Rwanda in on it? Rwanda been on in on it a couple of times. 
they pulled this mess a couple of times. You know, with the Rwanda, you know, them boys, them cat, them cats is crazy. I mean, they um a couple of times they did uh they did it in 2016, 2017. They took uh they took a check from Great Britain. Uh, was it Great Britain? I'm trying to remember who they did. No, because they've been taking. They, they said they've taken people. This is the most densely populated country in Africa. But they took people from Congo because there's even civil war in Congo. In fact, that's the, the brother who got killed by that punk cop in Grand Rapids the other day. He's Congolese. Uh, and of course, the cop said, "Wait a minute, hold on. You're not a descendant of slavery, so therefore I can't harm you." So wait. Anyway, the point is, wow. yeah, but he, he his mother was like, we fled a civil war in Congo. We get here and this is what happens at the hands of the police. But anyway, Rwanda took in Congolese. They took in Pakistanis. Uh, they've had people come from Burundi. But this time the British wrote them a check. I forget for how many millions of pounds or dollars translation equivalent. And for the next five years, they have agreed to take illegal immigrants from England. So anyway, I just just, just oh, mentioned it. You know, it's interesting. When, as soon as you said that, I was thinking about how they were having the debate about where to put Israel and it was going to be in Uganda. Like the Jewish people wanted it in Uganda. And I was like, that's a strange place to want Israel to be in Uganda. I, oh, so it is African. Wait a minute. Like I was, I was confused by that. And I was like, did the Ugandans, were they okay with this? Like, so Brit, British, the, the Brits got together. So they were like, oh, well, yeah. we have this place called, you know, Palestine. We'll give it that to you. And I was like, well, what about the Palestinians? Did they have, so the Ugandans were just going to be like, okay. <sighs> well, I mean, because it was no Uganda. I'm mean, again, like you say, come at that time, you're talking about what they would call protectorates or colonies. So they don't have any independence. This is this is settler colonialism. They told those people, no, we got the gun. We drew the line, this imaginary line, and we'll send people wherever you want. And you're right. I'm looking. I, I had that book out. And I mentioned it before. Robert Weisberg's book, African Zion, where he talks about some of that. I mean, you know, part of the logic you know, is it the Garden of Eden. Is this the original Garden of Eden? Again, knowledge by faith driving it. Um, it was 120 million pounds that the British uh, had paid the people in uh in rwanda and it was uh oh thank you thank you prof 2016 17 it was israel that was sending people to rwanda i guess they just take the check anyway uh yeah the australians pulled this too back in 2013 when they had people who they said were illegally immigrating, they put them on a little island off the coast of Australia. I mean, so you know, these these white ge stuff. geographically, none of this is in the quote unquote Middle East. So, like, oh. you have Somalia on the coast, Kenya mm -hmm. next to it, then Uganda next to Kenya, almost towards the middle of the continent. Rwanda's right under, and Burundi right under, and Tanzania right under Uganda. They're landlocked. It's not even like oh, it makes yeah. no geograph like what. Paul Kagame, you know, the leader of Rwanda, who some people are saying, you know, I don't sound like Donald Trump, who has often been portrayed in Western media and even by some kind of Africans as a leader and a forward thinker and a pan-Africanist in some ways. And other folks, and there's, there's a couple of recent books on Rwanda for the folks in the diaspora, African diaspora who sees on, I'm looking, there's one over here, but I don't know if I can put my hands on it. But at any rate, um, the guy is uh, oppressing, you know, you, he was an ex-military guy. And so he uh, is suppressing internal dissent. He has engaged in all kind of heavy handed behavior up to and including disappearing people. The, the cat who uh, was the lead person who inspired the movie Hotel Rwanda. He gets locked up as a political prisoner, all this kind of thing. But in other words, Rwanda is making moves designed to expand its influence beyond its country, led by Paul Kagame, its leader. And so a lot of this is just politics and it's geopolitics. So, you know, when you cozy up to these criminals, and by criminals, I mean every, all these people in Europe, all these European countries who came up with this concept of the nation state, a disease in many ways that we are, maybe that fever will break in the next few decades or maybe a, a century or less. Um, it's a problem. But anyway, I mean, but, 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 but what, you, what you raised with Elon Musk and, you know, and I, yeah, I promise this will be real quick. I just want to put a bow on that Easter thing. We we paused on Easter. Let's just finish it right quick. These are all 
rituals of the equinox. That's why they occur around the equinox. They are celebrations of the renewal of life. The renewal of, as Howard Thurman would say, hope. Now, you might even put Passover in that. If you saw in Israel uh, last week, this uh, lady who was a member of the coalition government switched sides. She went over to the right wing side and they saying maybe Netanyahu will come back. And as we talked about last week, Passover, uh, Ramadan, again, renewal, lunar cycle festivals. The full moon appeared and Easter always occurs. Christianity, Easter, Ramadan, Easter, Passover, all converging there in the state of Israel. Tensions are high. And of course, Easter always occurs on the first Sunday after the new moon, new before moon. That's why it's always shifting because the first new moon, first new moon. So any new moon? No, the first new moon after the spring equinox. Oh, spring equinox. And so finally, the reason there are Easter eggs, the reason there's an Easter bunny and you stick it all on the lawn and you got a cross with Jesus hanging on it next to the Easter bunny, next to the eggs and people don't trip is because we have been socialized to accept all that. And it doesn't make any sense except in a social structure that could not eliminate all of those equinox and spring festivals that people were doing before Jesus showed up. And if you want to convert them to Christianity, you're going to have to take some of what they've been doing. So whether it be the Roman Empire, whether it be the Anglo-Saxon traditions, where they got a whole line of gods and goddesses of uh, springtime, some of which are represented by rabbits and eggs, eggs symbolizing life, even a lamb. You could throw a lamb in there, right? Jesus, the lamb of God. You see Easter lamb. What is an Easter lamb? So the eggs, the rabbits. What do rabbits do? Reproduce. You have some rituals where they slaughter a rabbit before they start the springtime ritual. I mean, and I'm not even going to get off into all the various interpretations of the feasts where among thing, among one thing they would always, well, I'm going to say they, what you see in some of the traditions of pre-Christian Europe is these sex parties and women, virgins, disguising themselves and hiding and if you catch the version, then you can have sex with her. It's very beast, uh, very, very violent. I mean, you think about that next time you color an egg and hide it somewhere. Oh, I got an egg. <laughs> okay. The point is, you don't throw anything away if it's going to allow your social structure to absorb those people into a, a hierarchy you're trying to maintain. And a great deal of that has to do with people being able to see themselves in some social structure without seeing what you're doing, Elon Musk. Oh, wait, Juneteenth. Wait, lift every voice and sing. Wait. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. And the thing is, you can't if you if you massage it enough and you cut off the memory enough and you sell people on the idea that somehow this, whether it be in the religion, which is a, a form of way of knowing, whether it be in the religious category, which instills hope. For this glad surprise, this permanent life, if you try to negotiate for that, they're going to buy into it. If you have them see, I see myself in this, you can diminish, you can diminish their developed capacity to see beyond that self. So the people, well, no, nah, I'm not going to get into that because I can hear in my mind and I probably need to call him so I can get. Uh, get schooled because I like getting schooled by Jeremiah Wright. There's much more. I'm not a theologian. Jeremiah Wright is a theologian of the first order across beyond Christianity. So uh, I was I started to say, uh, you know, the whole metaphor, the whole idea of why people do what they do in these faith traditions is probably something that I, I shouldn't even opine on because again, it's knowledge by faith, and I don't get too far into that. But what I was about to to draw attempt to draw a connection to i won't do but what i will say is that social media mass influence has a great deal of it has to do with narrowing the context of what you perceive to be in your interest or what you perceive to be something that gratifies you the example i was going to use when you say you know, whom shall i release barabbas a robber a murderer or Jesus, the one they call Christ. Give us Barabbas. I'm saying, yeah, this is these type of people who right now be somewhere in a Twitter war on their thumbs. In other words, you 
y'all picking between Chris Rock and Will Smith because you think, first of all, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You weren't there. That ain't your friend. I mean, but y'all somehow got a side in here. Ain't no sides. The side is keep those thumbs moving on my platform so that I can value my company at X number of dollars. But your, your interests have been narrowed into arguing with people about a slap. And then people stand over there, which is why I said I paused because Jeremy Wright will walk me through why perhaps Barabbas is Jesus or the metaphor had a cosmic order or has. And so I'm not theologian, the but I'm just saying on the surface, looking at it, these people have been socialized in a certain narrative. And if you get socialized in the right way, you'll turn from the ones who the state wants you to turn from because they will have you believe that's public enemy number one. Yeah, but Robert is a robber. He's a murderer. Yeah, yeah but Jesus, this guy's a problem. He out here talking about militarism and capitalism and he talking about racism. And, I mean, yeah, I, I was cool when we was trying to get a hamburger and, you know, maybe get the right to vote. I get that and the dogs. But now you taking on, you talking about the United States, the greatest purveyor of violence. Hey, man, that's enough. Hey, where are, where are your friends who can afford suits and ties? Did they moved away from you? She, well, I looked at the paper and then Walter Concrete, I'm sorry, Cronkite, told me that this is a, <laughs> you know what? I don't want to, Martin, hey, bro, I see you. I see you. I see you, Colin. I see you, Kaepernick. I see you. I see you. Uh, Jackie Robinson, last night at the museum. I read this right there, and then we finished with, with Musk. When um and it was very interesting, and we'll talk more about this in a second. But um the panelists, and I'll talk about the rest of the panelists in a minute. But uh, brother Justin Tinsley, who was a journalist, was the moderator last night, and he asked me, you know, the first question he asked me about Jackie Robinson, his politics, and so I just read from this is uh, I never had it made, of course, published about a week after Robinson made his transition in seventy two. He says. As I write this 20 years later from when he broke into white major league baseball, April 15th, 1947, first official game, two days before they had played an exhibition game. But he says, as I write this 20 years later, I cannot stand and sing the anthem. I cannot salute the flag. I know that I am a black man in a white world in 1972, in 1947, in my, at my birth in 1919. I know that I never had it made. And I said, you know, I always start with the words of the ancestor because we want to never forget that Robinson was very clear. In fact, the last question he asked me, he said, just said, well, what is something that we get wrong about Jackie Robinson? And I said, well, let me go to page 180. I, I quoted, I didn't quote the page number that last night. I'm quoting it here. Robinson writes, I admit freely that I think, live, and breathe black. First and foremost. Now, y'all want Jackie Robinson to carry the flag. He won't even salute the flag. Y'all want him to sing when you play the national anthem. Y'all got your hand over your chest. Robinson wouldn't be singing or standing. And at the time that Robinson is taking his political positions, and I said this last night, Robinson tried to play it straight down the middle of his way best he could. What will help, not just me, because he writes about this too, and we'll talk about this in a minute. He writes about, you know, you can always have an individual black make it. He said, making black millionaires doesn't impress me. What would impress me is if you move a black family from making $6,000 a year to making $15,000 a year. Now, that would impress me. This is when he's critiquing Richard Nixon, who he had supported in 1960 over Kennedy and then felt betrayed because he said, I see where this white nationalist republic, he didn't call it white nationalist, but he basically sees the rise of Barry Goldwater and it's like, y'all are racist. Y'all anti-Negro, y'all anti-Black, and I'm a, and I'm not for y'all anymore. So I'm saying all that to say that Robinson caught a lot of hell from Black people. He caught a lot of hell from Black people because Black folk are looking at him like, well, how could you support the Republicans? And he writes in there, he said, you can't convince Black people to support the Republicans. But I thought at this moment, I met with Kennedy, I met with Nixon. I knew Nixon because I had met with him before. I met with Kennedy. Kennedy couldn't look me in the eye. He's talking about everything, foreign policy. He's talking about everything, but he didn't talk about race. And I'm looking at him like, how in the hell can you be a politician and been in politics as long as you have and not talk about race? You don't, 
you don't know anything about it. He said, he seemed like he was eager to learn, but he didn't know anything about it then. And then he asked me a question, which is why I ended the meeting. He said, how much would it take for you to campaign for us? <laughs> wow. I see you later, man. In other words, this is one thing I wish I could have met Jack Roosevelt Robinson because, and, and, and you know, shout out to, of course, to his wife, Rachel, who was out with their son, David, who splits time between Tanzania and the United States. They were at Dodger Stadium yesterday. In June, Rachel Robinson will be 100 years old. And I'm looking at her on that golf cart at Dodger Stadium yesterday. It looks amazing. It's, isn't it? Black, come on, black women. Y'all know what it is. Oh my God, doesn't she look amazing? I mean, lucid and just, I mean, she's walking. Like I said, oh, she's on a golf course. She's 90 years. Then she get up. What? Give an interview. Come on. It's beautiful. So anyway, I set out to say that public opinion, that's the metaphor, drives these people against Jesus. At the time he's crucified, we take that as the faith marriage. Public opinion has black people against Martin Luther King. Public opinion has black people divided and many of them excoriating Jack Roosevelt Robinson, who is seen was always like, what's going to be in the interest of black people? I'm not picking Democrat or Republican, even though now I can't even fool with these Republicans no more. I saw where this was going. But I, Malcolm X, him and Malcolm X used to argue back and forth. He said, I respect Malcolm. I mean, we're going to talk about Rob Robinson and more, but I'm coming back to Musk. Elon Musk understands better than most people in a capitalist society that, you know, you want to control public opinion. So, you know, Twitter, social media broadly, because young people tell me our oh, Twitter is old. What y'all doing? We on TikTok. Hmm. Lowest common denominator. Lord have mercy. And then I got some friends who are teachers who say, well, we got to make TikTok videos to, uh, to capture their attention. And I was like, good, you go do that. Why? I'm going to use like words to capture the new <laughs> because somebody gotta because what y'all don't understand is the people who are telling you that you gotta change your curriculum to make TikTok video, their children reading words, and they have narrowed through the shaping of public opinion your concept of what's in your interest and what is valuable to you, so that you can't see beyond what you perceive as your interest, shaped by this social structure to that. Wait, these are the people who make the computers, yeah? yeah? They got offices in Silicon Valley, yeah? And they don't let their children touch devices until they like eight, nine, 10 years old, right? So then why am I giving my three-year-old the pad talking about learn this? Yeah, why are you? That's the first thing. The answer at that point is less important than asking that question. Why? So Professor Hunter, why is Elon Musk interested in Twitter so much? And why did Twitter block him? And you're right. It's on the front page of the Times. Twitter deploys a poison pill against Musk. It's on the front page of the FT. Musk hit with poison pill as Twitter launches plan to thwart $43 billion. $43 billion? Yes. What's that about? Will you please help us just for a minute? Please I, help us. I, I, my question is, why is it worth $43 billion? Why is it worth $43 billion? Why is it? You know, I ask this question because to me, there's no Twitter without us on there. There's no TikTok. We make the dances up that everybody copies. Right. $43 billion. How much of those dollars have gone into the, the people? Because there's no Twitter without the engagement and the interaction. You know, that slap centered around Black people in a governance, social structure situation that people are still talking about. Still talking about it. Sandy Way Newton got fired from a job with Channing Tatum and Ma Magic Mike because of a conversation around that slap. It's still being talked about. That's oh, I not. missed that. Yeah, Sandy Way got fired. Uh, she got fired? She got yep. put off her job? Why? She took a side against Chris Rock? I don't know which side she took. Oh, it had to be against Chris Rock. So, In other words, Chris Rock is golden now in the social structure. He could do no wrong. So, I mean, they'll make grown ups three. I mean, she must have said something that was perceived as being against him. You can't, you can't stand for uh, for Will Smith, or maybe she said it don't matter, or maybe she was standing for Jada. You know, okay. right, right, right. Now, exactly. You know, she's very black. She's very exactly, black. exactly, exactly. In the way. Andy way. Oh man, she lost her job. Yeah. It's serious business.
called her a diva. But, you know, you ask a question, I think we should all ask ourselves because, you know, when you can't, you know, the brain's going to find an answer when you ask a question. Mm -hmm. Why did he make that bid $43 billion for Twitter? Why is Twitter worth $43 billion? And why did they block him? Because, you know, capitalism. Why did Vanguard step up and was like, wait a minute, all right, we're going to be the number one single shareholder because we can't let him. What do they know? And, you know, again, Elon Musk is a South African, so I, I, I feel like I can't, you know, rock with him because of how he was brought no, up. No, because he's a South I'm African. He's a settler in South Africa. That, okay. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be biased. You know, I don't want to be no, biased. I ain't biased. I'm just saying, well, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. That, that's, that's a question of opinion, too. Right. How do you define citizenship? That's true. He's born in, he was born in South Africa. That's right. That's right. But um, I'm, I'm, I, I think that we're in something right now. And, and it... Oh, there's no doubt about that. It begs for us to not just ask the questions, but put ourselves in the in the middle of it in terms of what is our responsibility to this, right? Like if That's right. if all of these things are happening, where where are we in it? And I and I feel like that is so important. I'm glad we're here to have these conversations. But sure. I don't know the answer to that, Dr. Carr. I just find it very curious and I think we should keep exploring the question. This is crazy. I love see the thing I love about FT is they just get right down to it for the money, right? We have to ask the question. He says, uh, Musk could finance the deal using his wealth. The South Africa born executive who often laments being cash poor is worth more than 260 billion on paper, according to Forbes. This includes his stake, stakes in Tesla and SpaceX. Moody's estimated on Thursday that Musk would need to cobble together 36 billion, less than the 43 billion headline valuation, accounting for the fact that he already owns an Amazon stake in Twitter, as well as the company's own share buybacks and cash it has generated since its last reported earnings. Okay, yeah, you know, the the outsized profiteering during the pandemic, where you know, cash infusions are used to buy back stock. He wouldn't even need to cobble all that together. But the, the question you asked, Professor Hunter, is really the question that we must ask. Uh-oh. Okay. All right. You got to unmute. You got to unmute. Okay. Do, 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 do. All right. You're talking, but we cannot hear you. You're muted. You're muted, Dr. Carr. It's okay. Okay. I, I, uh, I moved my foot and... I kicked the microphone out. So I'm back now. I'm back? Yes, you are. Okay. The um, question, we you asked the question, why are they doing it? Why is he doing it? Which is a social structure question. And, and why should we be paying attention? How does this affect us? How can we free ourselves? How should we be thinking about this? And of course, we have Nubia now. So <laughs> I mean, well, that's the obvious. But even in the midst of this, I was like... I remember a time when there was no Tesla. I remember a time when there was no Facebook, when there was no Twitter, when there was no TikTok. These no things, YouTube. No YouTube. And like that, and I'm saying in the last decade, these things have manifested and blew up into the, the wealthiest. He's now the wealthiest man in the world, right? Yeah, that's what the they say. I remember before there was an Amazon. I remember the, the How about we, were, that? we were talking with Tracy Sherrod. She remembers because we had those conversations she, when she was at Simon & Schuster, Henry Holt, now at HarperCollins, leaving HarperCollins to go someplace else, which we were not going to talk about. But at every turn, you know, we've watched the evolution of a thing. And my, my question for us, 400-year interruption. Hmm. Come on now. Watching all that was built, how... Howard French talks about it, right? You know, all of the kingdoms, you know, Viola Davis about to do a whole Dahomey queen king thing. And, you know, oh. we're going to go back to Wakanda next year. And, uh, you know, we have all of these iterations. I just watched Death on the Nile and I was like, wow, you know, yeah, they did that. I can't wait to go to Egypt. You know, yeah, but then fortunately we won't be going back to that one. Although we will pass by on the Nile every when we go to Aswan, we'll we'll pass by the old cataract hotel, which very much looks like the one they were staying in. That's where Dr. Ben them used to stay. But you know what's so funny? You mentioned that because tourism, black tourism being a major part of that, allowed for the revitalization of Aswan. In fact, there are many places we'll be going that really most people who do 
quote unquote Egypt tours don't go. They were added because of the study of Africans in the diaspora, primarily uh, in the United States. Asa Harriet and them, we go places and we're the only ones at the site. And they're like, y'all know the only reason these have been added are because black people were studying the Nile Valley. And white people, they go to pyramids and they go to Luxor and they go to Thebes. But wait, why are y'all climbing this thing up here for the tombs of the nobles? Oh, because y'all can read that stuff on the walls and y'all know it. <laughs> so yeah, that revitalized that whole. So we will pass by. In fact, when we take the boat, the Felucas, and we'll, we'll see the Felucas guys, and we'll take the little boats and go to Elephantine, go up Elephantine and go to the Nubian villages, to the people we always go, our fam over there. They always look at us, uh, um, all of them. We'll pass on the left side. That hotel sits up off of the Nile, the cataract. And you say, oh, that looked like the hotel of death in the Nile. Yeah, that's just the Agatha. I'm like, but but in like to your to your point in that film, I was I looked at the um commercial for it and I said, now how are they gonna flip this straight British colonial? They figured a way to do it. So we're not gonna make the straight stereotype, we'll make it a blues singer and her and her niece. And her niece, Leticia oh. from Wakanda. Wakanda, right. So, but in the middle of all of this, we're we're complicit, they can't do it without us. And yet all of this wealth that's being built back to Howard French, yeah, literal empires built off of our ingenuity, brains, and bodies. It's time for us to reclaim all of that. So, you know, I'll watch them. Is it reclaiming if we didn't, if there wasn't a we before that? Yeah, well, we're going to have to figure out that we thing really quickly, right. which is why we can't, we have to be zero tolerant. And all of the conversations being had right now, I jumped in on one with Michael Harriet this, uh, this past week. I, I was saw that. What, what was it? What was it? Reparations? I just, yeah, it was right. I just was in there to listen to Michael. And when he stopped talking, I left. No disrespect to anybody. And it wasn't. No. I just wanted no. to support him and to listen to him talk because, you know, he's he's us. He's part of what we're doing. Yes, here. that's and right. Kind of scenes. And I just like, you know. The division, it they're sitting there rubbing their hands, like you said. Those thumb, that thumb action is all for the profit of somebody else. And if we aren't intentional about not participating, that's right, like, and not being dragged into it, it's cute for a minute, but at some point we got to ask, uh-huh, uh huh, how do it free us? How do we? We're free not us? always asking that question. That we are part of the machine that's building somebody else's empire that's going to colonize and oppress and they're going to give us a Juneteenth and a Katanji Brown Jackson and we get a Kamala Harris here and there and here Negroes national anthem we're going to sing it at the football and give you Mary J Blige and all of the people come on that's not freedom it's not freedom well it's freedom and, for two or three people and this is what Robinson was saying that don't free anybody and and if they can build these things that now are the wealthiest properties digitally in the world in less than a decade, primarily off of our engagement, right? Yes. So Facebook's whole Cambridge Analytica was about studying us, Russia used. I mean, it was just you the, the blueprint is clear. Why why are we allowing this to happen? More because importantly, we don't see ourselves. Okay. We don't see ourselves as a we. So it's time. Like, well, I mean, it, it, you're right. I mean, it, well, I mean, it, you know, it's funny when Jack, this is what Jay Rob, Jack Robinson, like I said, he, I say Jackie, and I said this last night, I like saying Jack because that Jackie to me, that's a social structure, you know. He, anyway, uh, he's back and forth with Malcolm in the newspapers, they write and they publish in newspaper articles, and Malcolm roast jackie robinson you became a great baseball player after your white boss mr ricky lifted you to the major leagues you proved that your white boss had chosen the right negro by getting plenty of hits stealing bases he's critiquing him say so you basically a ball player you let yourself be used by the whites and so robinson writes back to malcolm in the papers and says i replied to malcolm saying i would cherish his reply and that i was honored to be placed in the distinguished company of dr bunch whom he had also attacked my ralph bunch i wrote in part he said, I am proud of my associations with the men you choose to call my white bosses. I am also proud that so many others whom you would undoubtedly label as white bosses marched with us to Washington and have been and are now working with our leaders to help achieve equality in America. And one of the other things Malcolm says, is you attack Paul Robeson, you let them use you against Paul Robeson. So Robinson writes back and says, I will not dignify your attempted slur against my appearance before the House on american Activities Committee some years back. All I can say 
is that if I were called upon to defend my country today, I would gladly do so. Remember, Robinson was a veteran who was court-martialed and acquitted at Fort Hood, Texas. And there's a petition that had changed the name of Fort Hood to Robinson because Hood's a Confederate general, but that's the, the heater there. Robinson was not uncritical of the military because remember, Robinson, who was drafted into the army in the early 40s during World War II, was stationed first in Kansas about two hours from where they locked Jack Johnson up at Leavenworth, Kansas, that, ja that Jackson, I'm sorry, that Robinson, who was a Buffalo soldier, 9th Cavalry, who became an officer because when he got drafted and was sent there, he said, there are no black officers. And they was like, no. So he talked to Joe Lewis, who then went to Newton Baker, black dude in, sec in the army, uh, secretary of the army office. He's like, well, we're going to get some black officers, bro. So they make Robinson lieutenant first, second class. And some other cats, Robinson, who then begins to advocate for his men, Robinson, who is transferred to Fort Hood, Texas, the tank battalion, Robinson, who won't go to the back of a bus when the white boy tells him to go to the back of the bus. Robinson's like, I think you need to concentrate on driving the bus, bro. This <laughs> leads to a court martial. Robinson, who then realizes, oh, yeah, I ain't going to hang me like that, goes out, reaches out to the NYCP, reaches out to other folk. Robinson, who then gets an honorable discharge from the army, and plays for the Kansas City Monarchs in the Negro Leagues, which is why I'm wearing my Monarch shirt today. Robinson, who is then not even the best player by far on the on the Monarchs, the Negro Leagues. Robinson, who then is re they reach out to him because he's a military veteran. He went to UCLA. Uh, he uh, just a beautiful brother. Uh, he's now 26 years old, so he's a little older. Branch Rickey is looking for the man to integrate baseball. I'm going to come back to that and we talk about Robinson a little bit more. But the reason I'm bringing all this up in the context of what you're raising, uh, Professor Hunter, is that um, when Malcolm says these white people did this and he writes back, yeah, I'm proud of, you know, my association with these white people. What he doesn't say right here in his letter is, I looked at Mr. Ricky like a father. He looked at me like a son. And, and I'm very clear that Branch Rickey did not ask me to do what I did out of love for me. He was a businessman. So every white person who I've had dealings with, Mr. Black, who owned Chock Full of Nuts, Mr. Rickey, who owned the Dodgers, Nelson Rockefeller, the governor of New York, I know they did what they did because it was a profit for them, political profit, economic profit, in addition to whatever friendships we had. So when he writes Malcolm back, this is where I'm going with it, He uh, and, the, and he also says, later that he wouldn't testify at the House Un-American Activities Committee again if they had asked him again because he he reprints what he said. He did not attack Paul Robeson, but the white press tried to make it look like Robeson versus Robinson. That's what they wanted. The slap, except a lot more meaningful because they took Paul Robeson's passport and them tried to line up these Negroes against him. But anyway, where I'm going with this is this. I won't read any more of the response to Malcolm. I'm going to go to the point because as you say, how do we think of ourselves as a we? This is what Robinson said. Malcolm was assassinated. Robinson was, he was torn up about that. He writes about that. And he says later on in this chapter, which is called Differences with Malcolm X, he says um, his death was deeply tragic because Malcolm, toward the close of his life, had seemed to be groping for and stumbling into a new religion, a different point of view. Now, we can stop here for a moment and say, OK, they're going to start saying and OK, white people aren't the devil. And so you can think, oh, Robinson didn't think that ha, 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 let Jack speak for itself. This is what he writes. He says his travels in Africa convinced him that the chart to freedom for black America. Shall listen to all these people who were arguing with Mike the other night. His travels in Africa convinced him that the chart to freedom for black America lay not in the setting up of a segregated state within America's borders. This was his critique of black nationalism. He said, I don't believe in a separate state in black America. However, I do believe in black power. Oh man, Robinson is no joke on this. In fact, later, another place in the book, he says, one of the things is Malcolm and I debated, I said, I like this. In fact, 
Robinson uses this in his critique of Richard Nixon, who said he was going to push for black people to have, you know, have access to capital. He called it black capitalism. Robinson said one thing Malcolm said, among some other things I agree with, one of the things he said, he said, I don't want a cup of coffee in the white man's diner. I want the diner and the land underneath it. He said, Robinson said, I like that. I agree with Jay Wright. Anyway, he goes on and says, not in the setting up of a segregated state within America's border, not in an approach of hate and violence, but, oh, by the way, Jackie Robinson was not nonviolent. He writes about that too in the chapter on Martin Luther King. Come back to that in a minute. But, but in a grand international coalition with African brothers. Pause. That's not natural. You have to build it. So when you ask, how do we recover? How do we reclaim? How do we remember? A lot of it's going to have to be claiming. A lot of it has have to going to be created. A lot of it is going to have to be fused from memory that was not a cohesive oneness memory then, but now upon reflection can be used as a common frame of reference to build one now. Mm. And that, that is the chance. See, this is where, uh, you know, I completely depart with all of my friends who see these black people, y'all, you Negroes always romanticizing Africa. There was never Africa. Black people sold black. Hey, 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 your mouth. Just so it shut, just for a minute. Do you see our open enemies over there? What? Do you see them getting in arguments over who's Irish and who's English? and who? Yeah, uh-huh, except when they got a common enemy. What? And that's your black ass. Because <laughs> the brother from Congo who got the back of his skull pierced by a cop's bullet in Grand Rapids. He didn't say, hey, I'm African. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were ADOS. Go with God. No, and the cop, what's his ethnicity? They didn't even release his name. Why? Because the police form like Voltron. They're hunters and they protect their own. Because we also saw, look, here go an old white man marching for you. They knocked him down in Buffalo, cracked his skull. Go back to work. <laughs> he's a human, but he's evolved with these non-humans, so therefore, you know, it's cool. Y'all following procedure. Well, every time they say following procedure, what that means is you're not human. Our procedure is to treat you like whatever the hell we want. And if people say, well, they said I fear for my life. If you are riding the back of a black person, pull out your gun, put it to their skull, and pull the trigger, that is the exact opposite of fearing for your life. <laughs> that means that you ain't scared. Put some fear. No, nope, stop. Read Toni Morrison. Read Toni Morrison's novel, Song of Solomon. Or better yet, while you're sitting there before you order it from a black bookstore to read it, if you don't have it on the shelves already, uh, go on your uh, search engine and type in The Seven Days. Toni Morrison with an I, Song of Solomon. I'll say less. You can look it up. But the point is that when we start thinking about the common frames of reference we should have, we understand that, um, and you asked, you know, why would Musk do this? Well, when we're controlling opinion, when, when, when our, well, not when we're controlling opinion, when our ideas are shaped by forces we haven't stopped and paused long enough to ask how they operate, we make choices that are better probably defined as in the being in the interest of somebody else's choices. And so, um, you know, thinking about it this morning and thinking about it this afternoon, thinking about it this evening, in a few minutes, the last day of our uh, Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations conference uh, resumes, and this is the last day, and um, I'm giving a, a talk later on called Intellectual Warfare in Times of Trouble. Um, ask hacking the challenge of leading a post pandemic with him and with him and is an Egyptian phrase, which means to repeat the birth. It's a few thousand years older than the concept of Renaissance. But one of the things that we'll be talking about is how we live in a society, as you said, that in which technology and remember, in our African studies framework, with those six categories, social structure, governance structure, ways of knowing, science and technology, movement and memory, cultural meaning making. The science and technology question asks, had, how did or do African people in the moment we're studying 
in the human experience or human experiences. How did it do African people at that moment either create or adapt to our uses, the science and technology of the moment? Well, over the last two decades, as you say, what we've seen is a shift in science and technology to create a capacity to communicate instantaneously from anywhere in the globe. And the assumption is that with this capacity would be um, a greater connection between people who can now build movements. But that's an assumption. All you can say is perhaps there's a greater potential. And I say perhaps because if we have connected on Facebook or Twitter, if we are in even, even the curated spaces that the science, technology, creative genius of narrative team has created in terms of Nubia, a place that is controlled by black folk, where we had these frank conversations, even in those spaces, if people are sitting in wherever they live and participating and having participated some endorphins release and they feel good about it and then go right over and continue their behavior, then nothing has changed. So the technology doesn't naturally mean that we're going to institution build, that we're going to do things in our collective interest, not only as African people, but out of that influence the world, which is what Robinson, who, mind you, I haven't to this moment, and I'll say something now just to put it in relief, haven't said a word about a batting average, haven't said a word about P. Ree Reese and his teammates on the Brooklyn Dodgers, haven't said a word about his most valuable player or Rookie of the Year awards, haven't heard said a word about his induction in the Baseball Hall of Fame at Cooperstown, haven't said a word about his stolen bases or hits or batting average, which was over 300 lifetimes, 10 years in the major, haven't said a word. Why? Because Robinson didn't define himself as a baseball player. Rachel Robinson did not define herself as the wife of a baseball player. One of the questions Justin asked me last night was, uh, in addition, he asked, you know, what do we get, what do we not, what do we get wrong about Jackie Robinson? And I, I, I actually appended it to a question that he had asked uh, two of the other uh, three panelists. And I want to mention those panelists right now, because I'm telling you, Professor Hunter, I was so I'm always honored to do anything at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Shout out to uh, the good brother, Kevin Young, who is the new uh, director there, uh, and my friend, Kinshasa Conwell, who is the deputy director, and all of the staff. I love those people. Um, and as I said last night, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Museum of African Art, and the Anacostia Museum are the Black museums in the Smithsonian formation in, in, in the Smithsonian Museums in D.C. But um, the other panelists, I knew one, uh, uh, my man, Dr. Damian Thomas. Damian Thomas is the curator for the sports wing. Anytime you come to the museum, all the sports stuff, that's Damian's job. Dr. Thomas, he does that. But the sisters, I am embarrassed to say I had never met. Uh, the young sister, uh, A.J. Andrews, who's from Florida. She went to Louisiana State University softball scholarship. She is a professional softball player. Not only is she a professional softball player, she's one of the best. I don't know. Have you, have you heard of AJ Andrews? Not, I'm looking up right now. <laughs> you just got me now. No, in her mid one AJ Andrews is the first woman of any background to win the gold glove. To I'm win a rolling gold. Yeah, her name is Ayana G Janine Andrews, mm -hmm. professional softball player. Never heard of her until I'm um, today years old. Born so, June 7th in Oldsmar, Florida. That's 1993. Right. She's something got two younger sisters, uh, one's on scholarship at LSU playing softball. The other, the other sister is uh going flam you. She's going to Florida and we talked about HBCU softball teams. I mean, she and, and one of her friends, we were standing there for a long time last night after it was over, just talking about the, the politics of race, gender, and softball. Here's a black woman who doesn't make a lot of money as a professional softball player. She's played in several teams. I think she's in Houston now, or at least say, but she can't live on that. She said they make like maybe $6,000 a year. So she says a lot of people were going to coaching and you can count the number of black women coaching softball teams. Now, mind you, because of title nine, many universities, including the HBCUs have women's softball because you got to have equal number of women's and men's teams. So if you're asking yourself, we got all these HBCUs. Yeah. They got softball teams. Yeah. So you got a lot of black women coaches. You think? I'm listening to AJ like, yo, since you giving me an education tonight about this, she wanted to straight up 
gold glove. The same one they get. In fact, she got her gold glove the same ceremony all the uh, Major League Baseball players got their gold glove. She's the first woman to win it. She's center fielder by trade. But anyway, he had asked, uh, Justin had asked AJ, and here's another sister, Elaine Stewart. I don't know if you know Elaine Stewart with a D. I do not. She is the first, the second black one, or the second person of African descent to achieve the rank of uh, top executive in Major League Baseball. She's an assistant general manager for the Boston Red Sox, and she's the first woman. She, St. John's, St. John's University Law. St. John's Law. She went to St. John's University as a Jackie Robinson scholar. Wow. In the 80s. I mean, she's uh, she's actually uh, vice president and club counsel for the Red Sox. Black woman. I'm standing there listening to her. And I asked her, man, you know, because in those moments, and y'all know how, how it is. Like I always tell my students when we travel outside the country, never go halfway around the world and not go the last two steps. So mm -hmm. I'm talking to them and more importantly, listening to them like I'm not going to see them ever again in life. Although I plan to see all of them again. Inshallah, as the Muslims would say. So I'm asking her, I'm like, help me understand this because, uh, Elaine, because when I think Red Sox, people say, well, the Red Sox were the last team to have black players. Okay, yeah. But I said, let me ask you, because she worked for the Mets. I mean, she were, in fact, I'm thinking to myself, Karen, got to know her because there's only one of her. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And she's been, I mean, as you said, she came out of St. John in the 80s, although like black women, you can never tell age by looking at black women. So I mean, she's been around for a minute. Yeah, and, 1988. And I came into the Daily News and the sports department in, eight, in 89. So, I mean, it's, you know, it it, I'm, I'm embarrassed right now. Because, but it just shows I I how, how disconnected. It's almost like on purpose. And I often say, you know, PR, you know, they have these PR reps to promote these different things. But this should be on the radar of everybody. And if you're Straight a black up. person in sports, this, uh, well, I, 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 I know my man, Howard Bryan is probably shaking his head at me right now. Like, girl, or not, but, but guess what? What we all know, everybody watching this knows is I suspect that there is going, there's, there are two conversations. Everybody's going to be able to hear at some point. Uh, the, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so this is why I'm saying when I said, when I met them, I said, Oh yeah, Karen, y'all going to be talking to Karen in a minute. If you haven't already. I mean, so, I mean, but the thing I was, I was asking Elaine about Spanish speaking Africans and English speaking Africans. I said, cause when I think red Sox, I said, you know, when I was growing up, Boston red Sox, we thought Jim Rice, you know, well, I wasn't, but I didn't give a damn about Carlton Fisk, Carl Yastrzemski, all rest them white boys. You know, I'm thinking white ethnic Boston because my generation was not my father and mother's generation who liked the Boston Celtics because they had Casey Jones and Bill Russell. We didn't know nothing about that. We knew Larry Bird, which means the race war in the NBA. You know what I'm saying? We we against the Celtics and anybody playing for them is a time. I don't care they got a black coach. I mean, it was that, you know, reptilian brain kind of race reaction, right? But I said, but of course, when I see Pedro Martino, or Martinez rather, uh, Pedro Martinez, when I see uh, Manny Ramirez, I'm saying, I think of that in the context of the longstanding population of people of African descent in Boston who came out of the Caribbean. That goes all the way back to Prince Hall and boys out of Barbados during enslavement, 18th century. And I said, how do we, how do we remix this idea that is always pushed in this social structure of blacks and Latinos? When those are black people who speak Spanish. And she said, she thought for a minute, she shook her head. And this is a conversation really, you know, I asked her that question and she's very you know, thinking about it, you know, and really, you know, working through it. But this is a conversation I would, I really want to hear the two of y'all have. Because she was talking about how, you know, people come to this country and it doesn't take long to pick up on the fact that people of African descent are treated badly, not only treated badly at the bottom of social order, and who in the hell wants to sign up for that? So that social structure is basically whispered in the ear of these cats, you don't want to be black. And they come from places where blackness is also held in lower regard. Mm. So it was fascinating to hear her talk. And of course, we didn't have a whole lot of time to talk. And this wasn't on the panel. This is before and after. We just, you know, you, you're on the stage only there for an hour. And uh, like I said, it was Justin, Elaine, AJ, myself, and, and Damien. And so it wasn't that long. But I relished that moment because, you know, you get insight from people 
who, again, we're not talking social structure last night. It's a black space. We're talking governance. Who are we to each other? And what I was asking her is who are we to each other? What I was asking AJ, who are we to each other when you got all these HBCUs with softball teams and you telling me all of them don't have black women or even women? But of course, black women as coaches. Mm. And so, I mean, you know, and so I, I guess I'm saying all of that in this larger context of how we create a we, those questions lead to creating a we. And if we understand that by we, I mean, those of us who are asking those questions, then the Elon Musk's of the world lose their power, lose their authority over us. So let's let's let, 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 let's bring it home. When we're talking about leading a rethinking, a building, leading a building, leading a coming together. And that's one of the things I say I'm going to talk about at the ASCAT conference this afternoon. What we have an opportunity to do with this new technology, what we're doing right now, in fact, is helping people imagine what to do with that technology. The technology is not the solution. The technology is a tool. The, the key is the way of knowing how do we view each other, which is why last Monday, for those of you not yet in Nubia, last Monday, we usually go for two hours, maybe sometime we, a lot of time we go over a little bit, you know, uh, with you and Tracy, I thought that conversation could have been the thing itself. Because we were just framing, like I said, next week, next Monday, it's coming up Monday, we're going to get into now Barracoon. Zora Hurston in conversation with Kasula Lewis, who was taken as a 19-year-old off the coast of West Africa, as we talked about last week, on that last ship that makes it uh, on a bet to Mobile Bay. The last Africans brought in at the at, as the Civil War, as the gun smoke begins. 1861, 1862, 1863, they are brought into this space and now they are forced here to Clotilda. Uraeus, being the mastermind that he is, this wizard, brings in this brother at the end. Mm. And the brother, and I asked Uraeus, did you know him? No, I didn't know him. What? Okay, the ancestors knew him. Chief Lewis, brother Lewis. Tell, tell the folk who Chief Lewis is. Uh, uh, he Lewis. is a direct descendant of that brother that was snatched from Africa on that ship and was, I mean, you know, but that's the power of this thing. You you were talking, we, you know, we built this because we needed a repository to put all of this knowledge that is in your head. And eventually, you know, in my mind, I'm like, okay, that five on it that you talked about with Carter G. Woodson, we're going to build this library, get them books out of yeah. storage, have a place yeah. for people to go to see all of the things you've collected and all of the knowledge you've collected so that we can have it and keep it like the Alexandria Library, like all of the pyramids. And then it was like, well, we need to communicate. And I was like, all right, all right, let's build that. Our Nubia was formed. This is not even six months old. Nope. So I don't know who's here, Dr. Carr. There's a, there's a, a clarion call moving in your spirit that will bring you here right now to more than a thousand people on a morning on Saturday before Easter Come in on. community Come chatting on. about this conversation Come as on. it is every week. And there's more than a thousand on Monday Come chatting on. around books. Mm. And I could, I can't make this up, but it's what I knew in my spirit would happen because you cannot continue in this ignorance. Once you know, once you sip this water, you can't go back. So this brother is Chief Lewis, part of this family that we built here. Popped in. We dropped the link like we do every week. He came in. You raised it? No. And then he was like, okay, let's bring him in. And it was amazing. Absolutely it was, amazing. It was amazing. And, and, and just the beginning, as you say, like you say, not even six months old, this space. And like I say, Tracy Sherrod, a major figure in publishing, so many books she shepherded to print in a governance conversation that I imagine what may not have been completely comfortable at all times, because you, when you are speaking <laughs> with us <laughs> as us, there are things, and I'm very aware of that again, again, always, I love, I mean, I hadn't been at a live gathering and participating in a live gathering at the museum since I interviewed Dr. Salters, Colonel Salters, who was the lead editor of We Return Fighting, which was the National Museum of African American History and Cultures exhibit on Blacks in World War I. 
It's very important. And so we were talking about that last night. I said, last time I saw y'all, we were in the Hollywood squares on Zoom because we did the uh, moderated, the conversation they had around the reconstruction exhibit that we talked about here, Make Good the Promise. I said, I ain't seen y'all in, 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 in forever. And I hadn't, you know, and I hadn't seen Reese. I mean, you know, Reese, we were rolling on Thursday nights for the last two years, hadn't seen her in person. It was so good to see her. And uh, of course, as I told you before we went live, you know, I, I left my phone at home, which was just beautiful. The only reason, the only thing I regret about it is they had one of uh, the five known uh, uniform uh, that Jack Roosevelt Robinson jerseys wore, and they have it on display for the next week or two down there. And so I'm going to go back and, and, and take a picture of it. But the beautiful thing about not having the phone was I was really tuned in to listening. I wasn't taking no pictures. I wasn't trying. I'm just listening and having a good conversation. But we are in a permanently altered world. and. As Tracy came in to a space that is very young, that, as you say, hits north of a thousand people. And there have been times we've had thirteen hundred plus, you know, on a Monday night thinking through a book. Now, you put this book into print. And now you come in this room. Wait, how many people? Wait, and it's growing. Yeah. And y'all reading this. Oh, OK. Look, I know you, I know you probably didn't know what to expect. I know you didn't expect this. And guess what? Say less. <laughs> because as we build, the action comes. And so when Brother Lewis, Navy veteran, same last name as Kasula Lewis, Chief Lewis, named Jason Lewis, comes on. I ain't say this to him because we got a month we're going to be reading Barracoon and bit by bit unlocking all this other stuff around. He is a descendant. American descendants of slavery. Y'all listen. Chief Lewis is an ADOS. Like I am. Huh? Like Jack Roosevelt Robinson, who had the sense to say Malcolm is the ADOS, except this is an ADOS who's been to Benin. Been to Weta, where his ancestors were taken from and sat down with the kind of Africans. What did Jack Robinson say about Malcolm? He said, Malcolm understood that you can't just limit this to the United States. Malcolm understood that you got to connect with the Africans. Jack and Rachel Robinson's son, David, for decades, runs a company, import-export company. What do they export out of Tanzania? Coffee. His daddy worked for Chock Full of Nuts. His daddy said, I agree with Malcolm. Malcolm said, I don't want a cup of coffee from Chock Full of Nuts. I want, I want the cup of coffee, the cafe it's being served in, and the land underneath it. Robinson said, yeah. And his son is doing exactly that. And Black was one of the three white men who Robinson, and I never had it made, says these are the right three white men who advanced my career. Richie with the, uh, uh, Branch Ricky with the Dodgers, Black with Chock Full of Nuts, and, 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 and Rockefeller, who was the governor who I got along with, although he critiques him on Attica near the end of the book. Remember, Robinson turns these pages in, and as Rachel Robinson, which breaks your heart, we talked about that last year, says, you know, Jack rushed up to me in the house in Connecticut, collapsed into my arms and died right there. Man, she's 99 years old, about to be 100 years old in a couple of months. And think about Rachel Robinson. When he writes this chapter in here, how they son, Jackie Jr., who went to Vietnam, came back, strung out on drugs, addicted, went into one rehab, ran away, came back, turned his whole life around, started managing the jazz concert they had at the house in Stanford where they raised thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars for SCLC and NAACP, which Robinson, by the way, quit the board when he saw Roy Wilkins was running the board and they weren't letting young people in. He said, I don't like this. The guy was always trying to play it down the middle. When his son, when their son dies in a car crash and Rachel is so distraught, she ends up just running out of the house into the woods and he sends David out there to go get her. She's seen a lot, yo. You know what I'm saying? And in terms of gender, again, Justin asked me, how, what do we not think about? And this is where I said on the dovetail of the question, he had asked um, them about the question of gender. You know, when he asked AJ and Elaine about gender, I said, well, let me attach what you just asked me to what they answered about and say, in the Western ways of knowing, gender is seen as a category that separates men versus women. And I said, y'all saw the first woman to be on a major league baseball field took the first base coaching 
uh, line the other night for the San Francisco Giants. They have a, a lady who's a woman who is a coach. She's on the 13-member staff. I think they've expanded the staff to 13. She was the first base coach. Did you see that, Professor Hunter? Oh, yes. You saw that, right? Yep. And so, but what I said was, I laugh, I laugh because I could see uh, Damon and them, and I, I laugh because, see, like I said, I, I consider them extended family down there at the museum. At the same time, I know I'm that Negro who lives his life in the governance structure. So I said, when the white girl ran out there, <laughs> y'all know how she got out there, right? Yeah. Because the black man who was the first base coach got ejected. <laughs> and the coach on the other team told the manager of Giants, you better, you better come get this MF. At which point the brother was like, really? Is that what we're doing now? He took it racially. <laughs> The ump throws him out the game, and that's how the white girl got on the got on the first baseline anyway. And all the headlines: woman, first woman. To be, I said the thing we don't know about Jackie Robinson, or we get wrong about Jack Roosevelt Robinson and Rachel Robinson, is that the gender, the gendered way that this social structure and the the ways of knowing that come out of it, think about human social relations. This is not the way everybody in the world thinks about it. Mm -hmm. And when you read, I never had it made. Not only does Jack Robinson thank his wife, not only does he say it would have been impossible without my wife, without her mother, without my mother, Mallory, without Mally, rather, without any of them, without you. He said, when I think of my wife, I don't think I think of we. It's we. He's always writing we. I said, just stop and think about that. It's not woman and man. It's we. It's community. That is a paradigm shift in terms of a way of knowing. It doesn't mean you don't have your individual identity. It doesn't mean you, have, you don't have your, but it does mean that you're not looking at the demographic to dictate how you move through the world. Well, women need to get together. Or the women, shut up. Just, could you please just be quiet for a minute? Because last I checked, there ain't no natural constituency called women. Because hmm. last I checked, I don't see all the white women in the world jumping out trying to defend and argue for a sister who was born in that same Grand Rapids where they killed this brother the, last week, this white patter roller. And if you're a black patter roller and would have done the same thing, go to hell too. Shout out to Eric Adams. But I don't see all the white women standing up to fight because a sister who was born in Grand Rapids, but who lost her life in Louisville at the hands of another pattern roller, roller, Brianna Taylor, whose mama was in Grand Rapids saying, you know, a lot of people don't know, Brianna was born in Grand Rapids. I don't see y'all with, with the black with black people. Where y'all with your sisters? Because ain't no such thing. And so I, I bring all that up to say that Robinson writes in this book, I never had it made, we, 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 we. In fact, he was so we, well, I'll pause there. It's important for us to think about that, that, that paradigm shift. But um, when Chief Lewis, when Jason Lewis was talking on Monday night, y'all, and again, if you're not yet in newbie, like I say, you be led to it by spirit. We ain't pushing nothing. Nah, because we we building something. We are building something. Not only did he, you know, it, it reminded me, and I didn't talk about it the other night. This is Ben Rain's book. This is the latest book. There are a number of books written on uh, the Clotilda and uh, what happened. Um Probably my favorite book out of the ones that have been written is by my friend and colleague Natalie Robinson, who Robertson, who was at Hampton University, um, who published a book called A Slave Ship Clotilda, because she went back to West Africa, went to Benin. And what uh, and, and I mention this because um, Jason is in this book. Chief Lewis is in this book. He's talked about in this book. And one of the things he talked to us on Monday, Monday night, and I'm looking forward to not only him, but so many others who are from there coming in talking about, he was talking about how this in Mobile, this Africa town gives us a focused physical place to open that portal to build those connections. He said, my daughters are learning phone, F-O-N, the language, phone, the language of their ancestors. I want y'all pause. What does it mean to be a descendant of enslavement? It doesn't mean you have to start your history from enslavement. It means if you start your history from enslavement, you just bought the damn social structure narrowing. This brother 
Not only can he trace his family back, if you're giving out reparations just based on who was enslaved, the Lewis is in the front of the line. And he done gone back. And he said, and he write, actually in the interview that he gives Ben Rains in this book, what he says is, the most important thing for us is not reparations, it's reconciliation. Oh, man. Pause. Reparations is a social structure fight. It's a fight the governance structure has with the social structure. But if there's going to be a governance structure fight, the governance structure must be strong. And what makes it strong? Reconciliation. Yo, some of us participated in that shit. We're sorry. Yeah. I know it wasn't all of y'all. I know it wasn't most of y'all. But that ain't even important right now what's important is we are family as robinson said about malcolm malcolm saw it and i'm with him on that huh okay and this and here, here come the social structure yeah but so you're an american and you you're what, 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 what i can't find that on the map but ben 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 yeah you're an american so look here's your flag here's your anthem uh why aren't you standing hey man jackie my name's jack and I'm not standing. Are you not a I'm a veteran. I was in an actual war. I didn't come to uh, uh, to, to, to Washington, D.C. on January 6, 2021, waving an American flag and wouldn't throw rice at a wedding, wouldn't bust a grape in a fruit salad. No, I was actually in a war. <laughs> you understand? I was drafted in a war. In fact, I got court-martialed a few months before y'all hung another brother who was in a shooting part of the war in Italy. You hung him by the neck until he was dead. You put him in a grave in France. And then a few years later, you killed his son. And the way you identified the body, because the son had the ring on that you sent back to that man's wife in Chicago. Yeah, Emmett Lewis Till. I'm not saluting that flag. I'm not singing that anthem. And I'm a veteran, one who would defend defending the country to Malcolm X, even as I agree with him that we got to think beyond the country. All of that being said, if we're going to have a governance conversation about somebody like Jack Robinson, then we better be prepared because the social structure is not only going to be offended, they may start looking at you the way the Romans looked at Jesus. So all the, I'm not going to call nobody a fake Christians. I'm just going to call y'all churchians. The way Aubrey call y'all churchians. Dr. Hendricks call you churchians. <laughs> In other words, all the churchians mad right now, go church and pray for me, okay? So at any rate, pray for me. Will you pray for me? Pray for me is like one of the most exquisite chef's kiss moments of shame to come out of the black church. It's like calling somebody baby or sweetheart. Now, it's interesting. I want to say a couple more things about Robinson when we wrap it up. Robinson has a chapter here, The Influence of Martin Luther King. He's very close with Dr. King. In fact, the, the only time I got a chance to have a few words with Sharon Robinson, their daughter, when she just published it, she published a children's book right before COVID about getting involved in the civil rights movement because her father would go south. He was with the entertainers. He took Kurt Flood down there one time. He raised the money. Robinson, man, what a fascinating character and she writes a children's book about like what it what was like growing up in that house when her father would come back and how she wanted to go with him on the trips i mean it's really something but he's got chapter chapter 19 the influence of martin luther king he said as much as i loved him i never would have made a good soldier in martin's army my reflexes aren't conditioned to accept nonviolence in the face of violence provoking attacks my immediate instinct under the threat of physical attack to me or those I love is instant defense and total retaliation. This is Jackie Robinson. Now, <laughs> they want to make Jack Robinson into, oh, he was good because he didn't fight back. F around and find out about this football player. The second best athlete in the family, according to him, because he idolized his brother Mac. And remember, Prof, we had that long conversation right. with the sister you interviewed? Deborah Drake. My God. Yes, he writes about that in the first chapter of Dream Deferred. How that system treated his brother Mac, who lost his job after he came back from the Olympics, winning that silver behind Jesse Owens. And if he had different kind of shoes on, may have won the gold. But Robinson, 
who's best sport at UCLA, four sport athlete, letter than all of them, best sport was football. How you still home all them times? And I said this last night, I said, which one of them white catchers wanted to be blocking the plate when an all-American level football player with a grudge black man come running down the third baseline? Shit, you got it, bro. <laughs> Dr. Carr. <laughs> yep, I know. Okay, now I'm mute. I'm mute. Now that was good. <laughs> that was good. Because that lets you know that Yogi Berra is a pretty strong ancestor. <laughs> Took me ten seconds to get back. I'm sorry, you, Yogi. I I know that uh the that this is a we're not fighting flesh and blood, y'all. We really no. aren't. And the more we, and that's why the we is super important. Yes, we we yes. need those numbers in this spiritual <laughs> battle that we're in. Uh, somebody called up my radio show and was like, every time you get on fire, the in, that my my satellite goes out. Oh no question, and, Elon Musk. And guess what? I'm glad. You know what? Everything happens for a reason. Right. In addition to the fact that clearly Yogi Berra and Jackie Robinson still arguing about whether or not he was safe in that World Series when the Yankees played the Dodgers, he stole home. And so he knocked this microphone out. <laughs> I know you mad, but they still counted the run. But more importantly, the question you asked about why is Elon Musk doing this? It's part of the answer is lies in what you just said. As we strengthen Tim, Tim Wu wrote a whole, at Columbia Law School, wrote a whole book about it called The Master Switch. They turn this off anytime they want. What they can't turn off is brick and mortar. What they can't turn off is the relationships that are built. What they can't turn off is Chief Lewis having established that relationship in West Africa, saying, and remember he talked about it on Monday night, how they went up, they've gone up to Montgomery and looked at the uh, the piece that uh, what's my man, uh, Brian Stevenson and them are doing, and they're saying, look, this is around enslavement, but imagine where the last Africans who came to this uh, to this country in, during enslavement. Imagine what that could be. And we're not tying it to slavery. We're tying it to continuity. What Africatown represents is the continuity. What Africatown gives the lie to is that somehow that trip erased our identity. What Africatown represents is the portal through which we construct a we. And that's why we're spending the next month page by page and then linking those pages to everything. Man, when Chief Lewis was talking about, brother, when you were talking about all the people who have descended on the mobile, National Geographic. In fact, I'm, I am going to pause here because I want to get his sister a recognition. Give me a moment just to get over here. Oh, what did I do? I had a whole, oh, here it is. I didn't. Here we go. This is March 2022 issue of National Geographic. And the reason I, let me see if I can turn to it. Oh my goodness. I'm very, I talked with these uh, sisters and brothers all summer. It was one of the projects that I did. Tara Roberts, that's her peeking out <laughs> of the water into the depths. Y'all should get this, get this issue if you can. 3 2022 National Geographic into the depths searching for shipwrecks from slavery's hidden past to heal help them heal the present hidden no more they have dived there's a group called divers with a purpose black divers they've been going all over the world here's Tara good young sister this is her article there's a documentary on that too they have been in the Caribbean they have been in West Africa they have been um look here is a map on how enslavement went you know this is the familiar map except this is the latest iteration just a couple more pictures i want to share with y'all because there are some people who uh and she traces her history her people from north carolina you see that's her great great grandparents jack and mary roberts north carolina you know in pictures black people had where you could get one of those and she connected she's diving she connected with these divers um here you have a picture of ayana flewellen who is a co-founder of the Society of Black Archaeologists with the brother who is next to her. That's my man, Dr. Justin Dunavant. He was my student at Howard as undergrad, although his Jegna on the uh, faculty was my dear friend, now ancestor, 
um, the great Mark Mack, who was an anthropology at Howard. Howard didn't have an anthropology program anymore, you know, because it's important to make sure entrepreneurship and business and the you nigga grows. Anyway, this is uh, <laughs> that's Justin Donovan, Donovan right there. They train black people of all ages, but particularly young people to dive and to do archaeology. They do a recovery work, y'all. Recovery work. They are in, in fact, Virgin Islands. Here's the anchor of a ship that had some of our ancestors. But you can't just go and see it from the shore. You got to get the gear on and get in the water. They've been around Africa Town. Here, this brother right here, Albert Jose Jones, been on more than 7,000 dives. It's considered the godfather of black scuba diving in the United States. Mm -hmm. Science and technology. And listen to Chief talk. These are, this hold, is a, hold that book up again. Hold, and, and is it out? Is this one of the books? Oh, this is National Ge Geographic. Okay. Yeah, Nat, Nat Geo. Yeah, yeah, yeah National yeah, Geographic. Yeah. It just came, in fact, uh, the April issue is probably out. So you might have to order And they have this. a whole documentary that I've watched. Um, with That's them. right. Yeah. The, the documentary is the companion piece. In fact, the documentary we worked on, uh, Tar was working on the script for the podcast. And so they convened a small group of quote unquote experts. And, you know, I took that very seriously. You asked me to do something like that. It's like when they called me from the museum. And they, will you come down here and say, I, I know that's that's an honor. In fact, that's a responsibility. And so I took it very seriously. And every time we would meet, she was like, man, it's like, why don't you be talking? It's like, listen, my uncle, except you got all these facts and stuff. I said, look, the only reason I went into this, and, and I want to quote uh, my friend Riketty Wimby, who is one of the early, the pioneers in studying the Egyptian language, a uh, member of ASCAT. Riketty, who's in Mississippi, Riketty said when she went to University of Chicago to learn glyphs, she said, I'm a product of the community, which is black folk at Northeastern Illinois, the Jacob Carruthers Center for Inner City Studies in Chicago. She said, I'm, I'm a product of the Comedic Institute. I'm a member of the KI. Shout out to Chicago, that whole crew, the Comedic Institute. She said, I'm a, I'm a product of the Chicago civil rights and human rights struggle. She said, I focused on students, not the academy. When I went to the University of Chicago, it was to learn the language, not to become an Egyptologist. I mean, the lame, she said, I am not interested in scholarship except as it helps me spread the knowledge. And so that's very important to understand. People get caught up in the titles. I wrote a new book. Ain't nobody caring about that. How do it free us? I see how it free you. I see how it got your name in the, the, the white press. I see how it got you a contract. And as Jack Robinson says, let me, let me go back to Robinson. Robinson, and there's so many other things I could talk about Robinson, but let me see here. He says, oh man, if I could find it. He says something about individuals and he talks about how, um, let me see. Oh, I thought I had, I thought I, I don't like to mark, I don't mark in this book. I have to put uh, bookmarks in it. You see why? Mm, wow. Rachel Robinson signed this book. <laughs> so anyway, in fact, this book was published under her auspices. It's got her uh, address and stuff in it at the time. So I don't, I don't write in this book. Well, what he, what he was saying is that it's not hard to make successful blacks. He says there's really a cap on successful blacks, though. He says, oh, here we go. Let me see if I have. Um, this isn't it, but it's close. He said, I believe blacks ought to become producers, manufacturers, developers, and creators of businesses, providers of jobs. For too long, we have been spending too much money on liquor while we own too few liquor stores and not even manufacturing it. If you found a black man making shoes or candy or ice cream, it was a rarity. We talked about not having capital, but we needed to learn to take a chance, to be daring. Oh, sound like Nary the Nubia, to pool capital, to organize our buying power so that the millions we spent did not leave our communities to be stacked up in downtown banks. In addition to the economic security we could build with green power, we could use economic means to reinforce black power. How much more effective our demands for a piece of the action would be if we were negotiating from the strength of our own self-reliance rather than stating our case in the role of a beggar or somebody crying out for charity? We live in a materialistic society in which money doesn't only talk, it screams. Mm -hmm. I could not forget that some of the very ball players who swore the most fervently that they wouldn't play with me because I was black were the first to begin helping me, giving me tips and advice as soon as they became aware that I could be helpful to them in winning a few thousand more dollars players receive as World Series champs. He was friends with Kurt Flood. The Dodgers did him straight dirty, but he said, I don't owe them nothing and they don't owe me nothing. He was negotiating with Chock Full of Nuts for a contract. 
he had said he was going to sell his, I think it was Look Magazine, he was going to sell his story to. And the Dodgers hadn't decided yet what they were going to do with him. Remember now, Robinson played when they had that basically uh, economic tether called the reserve clause. Well, not, not the reserve clause, but they put you on one year contract and they could, they they owned you. This is what Kurt Flood paid the price for breaking. Right. And Robinson complained. He said, when I when they inducted me in the Hall of Fame and he, I'm looking around, I'm like, where are these black ball players who benefited? They, they couldn't come when they inducted Branch Rickey. He said, you know, they should at least come here because, you know, he made it possible. He said, I, but I don't owe him anything and I don't owe them anything. The Dodgers traded Jack Robinson to the Giants. And he said, what? He said, oh, hell no, I retire because you couldn't be a free agent. Remember, I retire. The Giants called him and said, we'll offer you. It was almost double what he had been making before. Not to retire. He said, no, nah, I'm retiring because I got the chock full of nuts thing together now. And I, I mean, doubling Jackie Robinson's side, uh, salary almost, almost meant that the Giants offered him the princely sum of $60,000. <laughs> Jay Robinson didn't get rich. Oh, but that's what he's saying is individuals. In fact, he says that in there. He says, you can have individual blacks succeed in this society as long as they don't buck the system, in which one they'll be called upper the N words. He uses the N word in here and dismissed. But the thing that will change this that Malcolm understood, that Martin understood, that I understand. In fact, he said, I let me just be he said, is us pooling our resources. I, I would I do want to mention this because it's very important that we know this about Robinson. Oh, I hope I can find it quickly. Because uh, let me see. I do not. Oh, come on, boy. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. He, mm, I probably won't be able to. But what he, what he says in here, though, is that he's talking about Martin Luther King. Oh, wait, here he is. Here, here. Very good. Come on. Price, that's good. The price, that's right. He did it. Thank you, Jack. Because, you know, you want, I wanted to end with this, Baba. So he says, um, he it's not for the black only package. He says, this is one of the reasons I cannot buy the black only package being peddled by segregationists who are white and separatists and separatists who are black. But this is not what Roy Wilkins is saying. He said, he, he can go on to me. He said, there are those who sincerely believe that the racial problem can be solved if an all black society is created. They are flattering the black masses, making them believe an impossible dream will come true. The best opportunity for genocide the bigoted white man could have is to help blacks establish an all black society in this country. It would be much more convenient to wipe out blacks if they were all collected in one place. It seems to me wrong, in fact, evil for, quote, leaders, end quote, to envision an all black paradise to mislead a people starving for hope. Now, there was a difference of opinion there. And Robinson didn't live, just live to see the demographic changes in this society. I would agree for him and with him in terms of not concentrating us all in one place. However, he is not saying that we shouldn't have a collective mentality. I mean, it's a nuanced argument. Goes on to say this. And this is where the other balance comes in. Because you can hear people in social stories. See, Jackie Robinson went out. <laughs> Slow down. Robinson ends with this. I am not a fanatical integrationist. Robinson says, I don't think there's any particular magic in a white kid sitting next to a black kid in a classroom. He says, I simply don't want all black classrooms and all black schools in a system where the best teachers and the best equipment and the best administration go to the white school and the worst to the black. I see more value in making a ghetto, ghetto school great enough to induce parents of all races to send their children to it. I also believe both black and white children can gain something by being able to relate to each other. I am opposed to enforced separatism and I am opposed to enforced segregation. The first freedom for all people is freedom of choice. And he goes on. This is at the time he's working for the Freedom Bank, a black owned bank. They start for the purpose of getting capital to black people to build black institutions. This is the important thing to understand. Jay Robinson was for black power. And he was against any law that reinforced the hierarchy that put us in a vulnerable position. The question is, what will we choose? Elon Musk is clear as what he's choosing. We may not have all the reasons, but he damn sure does. And our question should be, okay, if you're doing that, we probably need to spend a little time trying to figure out why, because whatever it is, it ain't good for us. 
instead of trying to get an internship there. <laughs> anyway, let me stop there. <laughs> let me say, let me stop. I'm in the chat. I'm going to uh, provide the link to your conference where you oh, will wonderful. be speaking at 2.30. It kicks yes. off at noon today. Uh, you will be heading up the Intellectual Warfare in Times of Trouble panel. Yes. You're going to be talking. You're going to be giving a discussion. Yes. Uh, also, I see Leonard Jeffries is going to be on at 4.30. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's coming after me. Of course, he got to close out. Oh. Leonard Jeffries. Well, Leonard Jeffries is one. He's, 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 Dr. Leonard Jeffries will be at the conference. Yeah, he's one of the last. Uh, he, he's uh, there are two. The association, the first executive committee was Jacob Carruthers out of Chicago, um, John Henry Clark out of New York, Ben Yosef Ben Yakin out of New York, Asa Hilliard out of Atlanta, and the last two who are still uh, on this side of the earth, uh, Milana Karinga out of L.A. and Leonard Jeffries, Brick City, Newark. Uh, so I mean, he's. I mean, you know, he is he is one of the founders of the association and, and you know, we're grateful. Um, oh, I should mention this, too. If you're in D.C. around and you want to go around somewhere in the DMV, you want to go somewhere today. I think uh, today is Emancipation Day. It's D.C. compensated Emancipation Day. This is the only Abraham Lincoln, the only African people he had a hand in, quote unquote, freeing the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free nobody. In April 1862, Lincoln signed an act of Congress that it passed the Congress, House of Representatives and Senate, which did two things, freed the African, three things, freed the Africans of the District of Columbia, paid every white person money for each of those bodies, compensated the mass patients. So y'all talk about reparations, the only reparations we've seen went to them for freeing us and set aside about $100,000 for any black person that wanted to lead the country, Lincoln was like, yeah, colonization, send them away. Haiti, Nicaragua, Liberia, whatever. Y'all want to go? Black people was like, whatever. <laughs> the whole, the whole, but some people did leave. Some people left and came back. But the point, Robinson is making this choice. So today is DC Compensated Emancipation Day. Um, they have a parade. It's a beautiful parade. You see the high schools. I think Eastern High School is going to be the high school band that's featured. That's Malcolm X Elementary School marches. You see the young children. They got their red, black, and green. That's their colors. Uh, Southeast, South, Southeast D.C. And then there's a concert. I think CeeLo Green is going to be there. Slick Rick is a free concert in front of City Hall, downtown Washington, D.C. I think it starts at 6. So at any rate, you know, if y'all want to, it's Emancipation Day. But yeah, Dr. Jeffries will be there today uh, with us. And uh, next week, um, and this is uh, yes, what I wanted to mention when Chief Lewis was saying this. We talked about this Monday, and I know, see, y'all, Karen Hunter be thinking around corners. So by the time we get there, she already setting up some. And I'm listening to him, I'm like, man, and I said this you know, on Monday, we're gonna talk about this some more. We want to get on the road this summer, so it, it might be nice to end up at one of them stops in Africa Town, end up in Mobile, and do in class from down there, spend some time with the people and just learn, you know, from the elders. And so um, also we've been talking about, and I was thinking about this Monday, I went down because the, and I mentioned this before, if you're anywhere near DC, you gotta go to the National Gallery of Art to see the Afro-Atlantic histories. This is the exhibition catalog. Oh my God, it is, oh, look, I showed you the front cover last week. Let me show you the back cover because it's got Araminta, <laughs> Harriet Tubman, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It is, it is, it is, it is breathtaking. It is remarkable. Uh, look at all of that Equiano. Equiano is in there. And I, I mean, I showed you, I mean, I showed you a few pages last week. I'll probably do more every week just because it collects, um, it collects pieces from all over the hemisphere. When I tell you all over the hemisphere, it is truly remote. Not just it's got it's got sculpture. It's got documents. It really is something. And uh, I was down there and ran into uh, one of the Nubians. I told folk on Monday night, school teacher who was with us at Hershey um, uh, last month. And just I mean, we had a, a great time. So if you get a chance to go down there and do that. So we have our marching orders. Uh, you got to go get ready for your conference. Oh, yeah. Today. My goodness. And, yes, I know. And uh, I just want to say thank you. I will uh, see everyone tomorrow. We're going to be in community on yes. with Dr. Amin. And then next week, there might be a crossover event. We're going to work that out ooh, ooh. Uh, as well. Yes, yes, Told yes. y'all. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is, I mean, it's exciting. I love, I love seeing what's happening. 
um, being a person that is not idle in my words, I like to see things come to fruition or yes. not set. So we're going to see all of this to fruition, everything. It's a 20 year journey that I put myself on, but I know it's going to be even longer uh, because we all are going to see this thing evolve into what it's supposed to be. And yes. that is us together doing it. So I want to say thank you, Dr. Thank Carl. You. This is amazing. Love, love you, me. Nubian. Love see y'all in the Nubian street. See you Nubian back on Monday. See and on Monday. Uh, have a Monday. great conference. Wait, so we say Monday, uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, morning. Monday, Tuesday, Dr. Dr. Beatty, who is yes. the uh, head of ASCAP. But, yes. You know, he's doing his meta natural. On Wednesday, we're going to have a mental health conversation and conversation right. that is centered on Africana ways of knowing with yes. her, who I just met. Um, Dr. Narisa uh, will be with us. So yeah, we're going to keep it going. Yes. Building, building it, y'all. We're building it. We're all bringing our bricks and we are the bricks. So Wednesday we're building it. Wednesday at noon. And then we're about to do a, a financial piece next month. So we're, gonna, oh. we're putting all of the pieces together. We're gonna yes. Yes. All right. Love you. Love you too.